Okay, can everyone see my screen? Okay, great. Thank you, Rick. Um, welcome, welcome everyone. Thanks, thanks for joining today. Um, appreciate you taking some time out of your schedule. Um, in today's um, presentation that I'm doing, I'm going to talk about Fast API, um, and it's primarily going to be focused around Fast API. But what we'll do is we'll use um, Batfish data. Um, to to illustrate the example of um, use a use case for fast API. So um, let's get into it. Okay, firstly, um, I thought I'd just introduce myself um, for everyone on, on on the meeting today. My name is Daniel Teshney. I'm based in Melbourne, Australia. Um, I've been working in IT for quite a long time, roughly half my life. Um, and, and during that time, I've spent, uh, you know, the last 12 years in networking and more recently, uh, I've moved into the network automation space. Um, and, and now I just, uh, have a general interest in, in all automation. Um, a few things to, to highlight to you all, you know, I wouldn't be, um, someone who you'd call a classically trained, um, computer science or software engineering uh, degree student. So a lot of, a lot of things that I've learned, um, particularly in the automation and programming space is from doing things like a series of courses, um, short courses, longer courses, and reading a collections of books and blogs and labbing, and, and then finally just hands-on experience. So if there's anything um, that you see today that you think can be improved upon or you want to chat about, um, I'm always open to feedback in that space. Okay, quickly, um, I'll go through today's agenda. Um, it, I'm going to cover some, some theory or concepts that probably take around half an hour or so. Um, then we'll step into the demo and, and we'll see the, the actual, um, the use case. And then um, I'll show you how, how it works and um, we'll take any questions after that. So firstly, um, before, we, before we do that, uh, I think it's always important to discuss, you know, why are we doing this? So I'll just talk about why do we use APIs or um, in general. Uh, next, I'll talk about why, why should you bother looking at using fast API? And then I'll go into a, a couple of the key features that um, you might find valuable. So um, talk about this concept of a soft self-documenting API. Um, and then uh, we'll cover some unit testing. Um, for those of you that are familiar, familiar with that concept. Uh, then we'll go into the demo use case. And in that demo use case, um, we're going to serve Batfish data um, using Fast API. So um, just wanted to check, did, did everyone um, tune into to Rick's uh, Batfish 101 training or has any, does, does anyone on the call understand what Batfish data is? Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll talk about, um, basically, um, Batfish, you can, you can ask it questions and when you ask questions, it returns it back in a, in a thing called a pandas data frame. Um, and then that data frame is what we're, we're serving using the, the API endpoint. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the project structure. So, um, I've built a project structure that you could use in your own environment or in your own use case. Think of it like a, like a template. Um, and the idea there is to sort of set it out in a, in a coherent way that you could extend upon it in, in any way you wish. Um, we'll use the actual API endpoint. Uh, then I'll, then I'll touch on a, a few other things while we're at it. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about GitHub actions and how we can use that to automate our continuous integration testing, namely our unit testing for our, for our API surface. Um, and then take any questions that, that you have. So um, before I get into it, just like to um, just have a quick pulse check around the room. Um, does anyone here uh, build their own APIs at the moment or, or serve their APIs or have that sort of experience? No. Uh, cool. Um, has anyone on the call uh, used, you know, consumed an API? So, um, 
maybe uh, read someone's API documentation and tried to do some API calls? Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yo, Ken, did you just say that you used it for Cisco ACI? Is that right? Mike. <laughs> yeah, that's better. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll get into it. So um, why do we, why would we use um, application programmatic interfaces or APIs? And this, I guess there's, from my point of view, there's sort of three simplistic reasons why we, why we do so. Um, the first one is APIs um, provide a, a contract between between a provider and a consumer, and you know a way to access certain data. Um, so um, you agree upon parameters or, or conditions, and once those conditions are met, um, you exchange data. So um, this is like a, I guess, a fundamental reason why you would do so. So as a as a as a consumer of an API, you know. Um, as long as you tick the certain boxes that are required for that API, um, you then expect that the provider will provide you with um, what has been agreed. This is referred to sometimes as API specifications. It's the second thing. I mean, um, I'm guessing everyone on the call is probably familiar with abstractions, working in networking. It's, it's, it's all about abstractions, but um, in terms of APIs, Really, um, the advantage is to provide an abstraction layer between the origin of the data and the access to that data. So if you would imagine um, you're building some sort of automation solution, <clears throat> while it's feasible to, you know, do direct SQL queries on a database, you know, for data type A, and then, you know, write web calls for data type B, really, um, that's, that's going to involve you learning a lot more skills than you probably need to. So if there's some sort of way that, um, that can be abstracted away from you and all you worry about is um, providing the parameters to the, to the front end, to the API endpoint, and then all that, all that messiness or all that um, implementation on the back end is abstracted away from you. From a provider's point of view, um, this allows uh, the provider to, you know, change out the back end. For example, um, the, the front end API service might be back ended by something simple like a, a YAML file or a JSON file, or it could be anything up to a full scale, you know, post, Postgres SQL database. So um, that's what is the advantage of having an abstraction layer. And thirdly, um, having this concept of a centralized control point uh, where you can regulate access versioning and, and open access to that data. So, um, Obviously, if we if we talk about this in the concept context of networking, um, imagine um, you had uh, everyone making API calls to all your different uh, API enabled network devices from everywhere. Um, you have to regulate all that access. Um, if the API versions change on those products, um, you have to deal with all that. So potentially, you might look at um, using an API to centralize that. And, and do all the versioning there and, and then manage that back end connection or connectivity or translation of that data from the back end um, pages. Another reason might be you might not actually want to give people access to you know Cisco ACI to make direct API calls or or to your F5 load balances to find out VIP statuses. So having a centralized point you can abstract away um, giving them you know user accounts onto those systems. So to illustrate um, the point, I like to use analogies um, in these sorts of presentations. Um, and I'm going to use one that's that doesn't really have anything to do with IT, and it's you know talking about coffee and cafes. So um, just going through this, um, you know, when you go to a, a cafe, you know, you are the consumer, the person buying the coffee, and you know the cafe operator or owner is the provider. So you know, you go up to the to the front desk and, and the contract is essentially, you know, the types of coffees that they offer and, you know, your, you as the consumer have to provide, you know, the, the, the correct amount of money and you have to, you know, order the correct wording for the coffee and then the provider will provide you that coffee. 
if we move on to the second point in terms of this abstraction layer, um, you as the consumer, you know, you hand over your your, your three euros or your two, your, you know, your two sterling pounds, and um, the, the actual production of the coffee and what you actually get is abstracted away from you. Um, you're not concerned with sourcing coffee beans, you know, roasting them, grinding them, sourcing the milk of choice, you know, maintenance of coffee machines. All that stuff is um, abstracted away for you on your behalf. Um, should the coffee owner decide, I, you know, I get my bean provider through, you know, Alpha Coffee and they want to swap it out to Beta Coffee, again, they can make those decisions um, and it doesn't really affect your experience in terms of, you know, the front end experience. And then thirdly, if we talk about this, this idea of, of centralized control point to re regulate access, whilst it's feasible that you could go up to the barista directly and, and place your order, you know, having a front, a front end or a front counter where you place your orders through, um, you know, centralizes that request for access and, and, you know, um, making sure that, you know, you don't try and order uh, broccoli latte or, or anything um, that untoward, um, all that's done through through that centralized control point, which would be the cashier. So hopefully I've, I've explained that um, well enough and hopefully the, the coffee analogy um, sort of loosely translates and um, helps you get your head around sort of why APIs are important. Um, next, I'm going to talk about um, why do we, why would you use fast API? I guess um, given that there isn't many people on the call that um, have developed their own um, APIs or being um, providers for for their internal um, business units or maybe their internal network teams, um, some of these things might go a little bit over your head, but um, just just stick with me there. Um, so I guess the first main point is fast API is built on a modern high performance framework um, compared to other Python web framework incumbents such as Flask. So um, fast API is a project that's only a few years old, whereas, whereas Flask is, is, has been around for longer. And like anything, it, it has to carry, carry that historical debt and, you know, that backwards compatibility. Um, if you've ever used Flask before, um, and then you start using fast API, you, you'll certainly come to appreciate that. But, um, you know, if you've never built anything before, this point's probably not as pertinent to you, but um, just, just take it on, take my word for it. Um, next thing is it uses um, modern Python tooling or techniques um, to deliver these API services. And it's based on um, Python standard, standard Python type hinting. Um, type hinting is a is a relatively recent thing to to Python, um, and I, I'll get into that later on. And then I've just listed out some other key features here. So um, some of these uh, you know will make sense to you. Um, others others uh, are things that you're going to experience as a result of of using the product. I'll go through them quickly. Um, so it's based on open standards. So um, the API that that's delivered and served to the user uses the open API um, standard and, and you'll see the benefits later on when I, when I show you a, a couple of cool tips and tricks. This uh, it has this concept of auto, automatic doc generation. Uh, bad news for you, you still need to document your doc strings and document all your, um, your, your arguments and that, but um, you'll, you'll see that in play shortly. And I guess from, from my experience, um, you know, when you're using a lot of um, Python modules or projects, some of them require you to, you know, explicitly set a lot of settings that you feel that could be um, maybe abstracted away from you as a developer. So um, Fast API does a really good job here of setting um, sensible defaults for you. And, um, you know, less code means less maintenance. So, so that's a great thing. The data type validation. So, um, if you're writing any sort of application, whether it's a, a Python script where you're you're asking one of your, your your network colleagues to fill in, you know, IP addresses in a spreadsheet, really, um, you know, what you want to do is you want to validate that data that it's the correct data um, as close to the source as you can. 
you really don't want that flowing through your application and, and bombing out or hitting an exception deep down in your in your script or your application. So um, Fast API does a great job of um, enforcing this upfront and and passing that feedback back to the to the consumer. And so this results in you having to do less of that validation deep down um, with inside your functions. It supports all the security and authentication methods that you you would like um, API keys, basic auth, OAuth two. Um, in the demo today, uh, we don't have any authorization enabled, so it obviously supports that. It's really uh, it's got really good support for um, asynchronous work, so um, that's that's something that's that we're seeing more and more in the network automation space. Um, projects like Scrapply use asynchronous support, so um, it's a really good feature. I guess uh, last but not least, something close to my heart um, is documentation. So Fast API does a does a does an excellent job of taking you from the very basics and um, working through you know a basic hello world example, but then um, iterating gradually upon that example and helping you build out like a, a project structure. Um, showing you how to refactor your code and and, re, and and scale it and structure it appropriately so that you can add in more and more functionality. And finally, it has, you know, deployment templates for your standard sort of fast API tech stacks. Okay, next um, I'll talk about um, something I mentioned before, which is this concept of a self-documenting API. So, um, as mentioned before, Fast API uses type hints for data type validation enforcement. So um, you'll you'll notice um, as I go through the demo, you know, if we specify that a a variable is a boolean, it's going to um, only allow the user to supply a boolean, so a true or false value. And if this user supplies dog for that variable, it's obviously um, going to give the relevant error. Uh, does anyone here uh, write? Uh, does anyone here use Markdown to to document their their GitHub projects, or or has written in Markdown at all? Yep. Yeah, I certainly have. Yep. So, um, one one really cool feature is is doc strings. Um, you you know within your Python modules accepts Markdown formatting. So, um, we can we can just um, Prettify our our API documentation and just leave the user with a better experience and you know um, draw their attention to specific things that we want to highlight. Um, and also, you can model and document the responses and the response codes. So um, when when let's say our um, our API, uh, you know, we say I don't know. Um, get vendor and we supply say a device ID, um, you can actually model the response that you're going to give back to the consumer. And then the consumer can rely upon that, that data structure being in place so that they can write their automation on top of that. Um, I'll show you an example of this, um, which, which, which will solidify these concepts a little bit more. Um, uh, and finally, other frameworks such as Flask require another file to be maintained and updated with the API documentation. So um, like anything in life, if something's in two places, there's a 50% chance that you've, um, that you've got something correct. Um, so, you know, any time that we can um, simplify this process of, of um, the place to maintain documentation generally leads to the documentation being kept up to date. Excuse me. Okay, um, so now what I'm gonna do is um, I'll just talk through a couple of screenshots. Um, can everyone see that? Is the resolution okay? Hopefully it's okay. Um, yep, so um, in the top left-hand corner here, this is just a snippet of a, of a, of a Python function that's gonna be used by our fast API endpoint. And so, um, at the top, these are these are what are referred to as type hints. 
So what we're doing is we're um, defining the date stamp variable and we're, we're typing, we're, we're um, classifying it as a string and we're um, setting up a default value, which is this string here. Same with file prefix, it's a string and it has a default value. Um, we can also, um, you know, specify um, something with no default. And then finally here we have this active um, variable and we've defined it as a Boolean and the default value is set to true. For those of you that have ever written uh, Markdown before or looked at like a raw Markdown file, you'll notice the double asterisks, which tend to indicate um, bold highlighting of, of, of Markdown text. There's also, uh, you know, single underscores, which indicate italic formatting. And then this, this backtick format. So, you know, um, for those of you that use Slack, Slack uses Markdown as well. So, you know, this is a way of um, showing us something as, as like a code style formatting. Um, and then finally, you've also got like these um, single, single dashes, which should indicate a, a, an indented list. So on the right hand side, if I bring up the API documentation, um, you can see that, that the, the dot points have, have come in. Um, we've got our, our bold highlighting. We've got um, italic and, and the code style formatting. So um, this is like a really good example. You just document your doc strings here and then it flows through to the API documentation. No, no messing around with documenting your doc, your function, and then um, writing another document. So, th so this is really handy. But um, I guess the real power is if you, if you look down here, we've got all our parameters that we're going to supply to our API endpoint. And in here, you'll notice in here, the variables uh, are showing up and you can see that the default variable is, is displayed here as well, but it's also telling the user that it's um, a string. And as I mentioned before, because it's a Boolean, um, there's only really two values that you can choose for a Boolean. So um, it's not, let, it's not um, presenting the user with a free form text field because that's not what this data, what, what this variable type is. So this is, um, this is really helpful. Does that make sense to everyone? Cool, cool, yeah, makes sense. Okay. All right, so um, let's go through a couple of, couple of other examples. So um, what I'm showing here is um, essentially you write your Python functions within, within your within your module and the way that you tie a, um, you know, a Python module to a, to an API endpoint is you use this um, thing called a Python decorator. Um, so you're decorating this function and the minimum that you need to re supply is um, the operation of the endpoint. So in this example, I'm specifying this endpoint is a get operation and the API path all this other stuff's optional, but I'll go through it and I'll just sort of show you um, how you can document things and, and how, how they flow through to the consumer. So you can put a summary on what your API endpoint does. Um, and then talk, talking about this like res return response model, we can um, model our responses. So this is a, if it's a successful 200 um, get, then we tell the, the API documentation, you know, like a description of what they should be expecting back. And then we can um, actually model, you know, what content type it is. So, um, you know, most things, most things these days are JSON in a JSON format, but, you know, you could change this to application XML. Um, and then this is, this is actually the return pay, the example return payload. And in this example, all I'm doing is um, this is just a, a a globally defined variable and this is this variable was defined in another file so that's the reason for me showing it on two different screens and what i'm doing here is i'm modeling the response that that the consumer can ex expect so in here i'm showing examples of um it's all going to be nested under this df data um, top level dictionary key and then there's another um item under there and that's the the pandas index number 
don't don't worry too much about that. But then in here, I'm sort of telling the user, you know, what what you should expect, what keys you should expect back in a dictionary, and what those values should be. And as you can infer, the bandwidth value is an integer. The blacklisted value is a boolean. You know, and that there's some lists here, and then there's some strings, and so on and so forth. And so then we end up with this in our API documentation. So um, the user can go down in the API docs and they can see, okay, so the content type is application JSON. And here's an example of what you should expect back after running this successfully. So you can tie all this stuff together. Any questions about that? The only question I was going to ask is about, so you've got the, the 200 response there. Um, yep. How does it deal with like 404s and, and whatnot? Yep. So um, you can set specific responses per API endpoint, or you can set like default responses across all your endpoints. So in this example, um, I've got a default 404 message defined in another part of this project and that's applied across all my endpoints okay cool cool yeah so so it saves that um repetition of code yeah because obviously the response is endpoint specific for example this example we're getting all the active or an inactive batfish interfaces so the the data frame or the format of the data you're expecting back is you know the interface data frame but if you will like setting one up for retrieve BGP routing processes, obviously our response would look a little bit different. Cool. Cool. All right. So um, again, I know, I know no one on the call is, has developed probably their own applications, but um, I just wanted to show you like the equivalent in Flask, which is the other framework that I was referring to before. So um, the API documentation is maintained in another file. And, and as I said before, like that's prone to documentation being missed. So this is another project that I developed. It's called um, Net API. Um, I developed this late, sorry, uh, earlier last year. And essentially all this does is um, it's basically an API that um, you supply some some information to and it'll make backend calls to actual live network devices. Um, we, we don't really need to get too involved in the code, but I can just tell you roughly what it does. Essentially it uses a napalm getter and nor near. So it um, executes a nor near task and um, does a napalm getter. And then if it's if it's not successful, it returns a status code of 500, which is an internal server error. Um, but if it's successful, it returns the, the JSONified, um, the JSON related translated object and a status code of 200. So this is in one file. Um, so I've got my app high level folder. And then in this net PY um, module, I've got this function called get users all. And then on the right hand side, so we don't, so this doesn't use pipe, this doesn't use decorators. So you actually have another file called a swagger.yaml file. And this is how you sort of relate these things together. And as you can see, um, to define the response schema, you have to use YAML. Um, and as you can see, it's, I mean, it, it does the same thing, but it's, from my point of view, it's just a lot more clunky because you have to do all these crazy levels of nesting. And it just, um, it just makes it, um, you know, like if for any of you that have, that have used YAML on the call, obviously um, indentation is always fun and it can um, sometimes trip you up, you know, if you've got the wrong indentation. And then finally, like this is the, this is the API documentation that you see. So it, it roughly, it roughly shows the same stuff as, as I showed in the last slide but it's just a little bit different way of doing it. And as I said, it's, it's across two different files and, you know, you need to make sure that you remember that 
this endpoint is related to this endpoint. So unless you're using some sort of implied naming standard, you know, you might end up updating the wrong API documentation. Whereas if it's a decorator on top of that module, like mentally, it's going to be easier for you to make that correlation. Uh, next, I wanted to move on to unit testing. Does anyone here um, perform unit testing or understand unit testing? Yep. Yep, yeah, cool. All right, so yeah, for, for, for those of you that don't, um, unit testing is just basically the lowest, I guess the lowest, um, like the lowest level of, of testing that you could do um, as part of like a wider testing strategy. So, um, you know, uh, a unit test is usually like a dis you're testing a discrete piece of code or maybe a discrete function within your global application. So next, I just want to talk about um, unit testing in the context of fast API. So fast API comes with a test client, um, which simply simplifies testing with PyTest. PyTest is, um, is, is a commonly used Python framework. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a few um, videos out there where people have used PyTest for, for network automation. Um, if any of you are interested in knowing those videos, just contact me later and I can, I can send you those. Um, so on the left-hand side, I'll, I'll just go through this, this bit of code. Um, so essentially, um, the first, the first line here, we're, in we're importing the test client. Um, these five or six lines have got to do with, um, relative pathing. So I want to import some, some local, locally defined modules. So I just need to set that up. This line actually imports our, our app. So the, the main fast API application that actually runs all the endpoints. These are some other local imports. And then essentially what we do is we take our app here and we initialize the test client. And so what that actually does is um, instantiates or, or presents to, to, the, to the module um, a locally defined um, instance of our, our API server. So now we can run all our unit tests um, on an instant, on a locally instantiated version of the, uh, of the API server. So we're not, we don't need like a live um, or a dev environment and need to set up a dev fast API and then run a Python script from another system and, and, and run our tests on it. So this is one really great advantage of this. This, this second screenshot is just me setting some, some global testing variables so that um, I avoid repetition. So um, basically, um, you know, this is all the same, the same file, but, you know, setting up, you know, what, what's my good date stamp, what's my good file prefix. The, the API that we're talking about um, hits a certain endpoint. I've just got some bad data in here as well. With unit testing, you know, you want to assert that, you, you know, you want to do a bunch of tests. So you want to assert that one plus one equals two, but you also want to assert that one plus one does not equal three. So um, that's why you need good data and that's why you need bad data because you want to make sure that your application is, is working in the way that you expect it to and failing in the way that you expect it to. And then finally on the right, um, all, all I'm doing here is uh, I've got three unit tests, which, which I've shown. There's, there's a lot more in this particular file. But basically, um, I'm using uh, Python F strings to sort of format together all these variables. And basically, this line 62 is essentially just doing a, a get request to the, to the test server. And um, in this example, it's going to test this endpoint with a good date stamp. So with this date stamp over here. Um, we check and then we just do a bunch of assertions. So um, again, back to my example, we're, we're asserting that one plus one equals two. So in this example, we're as asserting that we should get a valid good HTTP status code. Then we're asserting that, you know, the content type is application JSON. You just have to take my word for it that no, there it is there actually. Um, then we're asserting that the 
when we get the JSON, when we get the response back, we convert it to a um, JSON object. And because we know that um, the DF data dictionary is the top level key, we're checking that there's at least one um, there's at least one element in that in that list of um, the the list of keys under the DF data frame. So basically, we're just checking that there's some data inside there. If we look at this second function, um, what we're doing now is if you look at line 62 and line 72, we're essentially checking with a bad, bad date stamp. So in this example, it's the year 3021. Hopefully no one's reading this presentation or watching this in 3021. Um, but yeah, so now we're, we're putting in bad data. So we should expect a, a 404 the file is found. We still expect that the response is a, a, an application JSON content type. And then um, again, I've globally defined the default API 404 response. And um, we're just checking that that response matches that dictionary. So, I mean, unit testing is really important. Um, as you, as you um, develop like an API endpoint, I'll just use API as an example. Um, as you develop one API endpoint, you obviously want to check whether it's good or check whether it's bad. Now, if you do this manually by you know using Postman or using a web client, you've got to keep a mental model or a mental log. Did I did I test my endpoint? And then you go and change something in your code, something trivial. Then you need to retest everything. So um, the concept of unit testing is a, is an upfront investment that you make. And then once you've written your unit test, anytime you need to change anything, you just run your unit tests again. And your, your um, intended behavior is validated. Obviously, if you add a new endpoint, you're going to have to add new unit tests. If you remove an endpoint, you'll have to remove unit tests. If you modify an endpoint's parameters, you'd have to write different unit tests, but it's a, it's a really good habit and discipline to get into um, early, early, earlier on in your programming life. Okay, um, now we're gonna talk about the demo use case for today. So what we're gonna show is um, using fast API to serve, serve Batfish data and expose it via an API service. So what we're going to do is we're going to retrieve um, we're going to retrieve a Batfish data frame. So for those of you that are aware of Batfish, you can ask Batfish a bunch of questions, and the answers come back in a Batfish data frame. Uh, oh, sorry, a um, a pandas data frame. And with a pandas data frame, you can convert it to many formats. You can convert it to CSV, to Markdown, to HTML, to JSON. Um, it's a very flexible data format. In this example, what I'm doing is I've already pre-retrieved the data and I've saved it to a CSV format. And when the API consumer asks for that, that particular file or that particular data, I'll take the CSV data, convert it to JSON and present it back to the consumer. Sorry, just one sec. Apologies about that. Um, in today's example, I've only developed a single API endpoint. So I haven't done all 53 Batfish questions. However, like the code and the structure that I'm showing you today is developed so that you could extend it if you wish. Like if you wanted to add another question and another API endpoint to this demo, you could certainly do so. Um, but also um, just to give you a, a way of like setting, setting up a fast API project from scratch and then getting that good structure in place so that you don't, um, you know, write a bunch of code and then have to refactor your folders and refactor all your imports. Okay, so um, we're, nearly, we're nearly there. Um, just a couple of slides to go. So, um, I thought I'd talk about the, the project structure um, and structuring all the files 
and folders in a certain way so that so that this um, this project is scalable and you know it's relatively neat and and logical. Um, so what I'll do is just just talk through sort of the high level folder. So you have the app folder, um, you know that's going to contain our application based components. We have the DB folder, that's our database. And as I mentioned in this example, it's just a bunch of um, date stamped CSV files that have our Batfish data. We have the sample configs folder. So um, inside there is my sample Batfish configs. And that has an example um, Batfish network in there. And I've, I've put all my lab configs under the configs folder, which is the accepted file folder format for, for Batfish. I've also included the, the layer one topology JSON file as well. Um, by default, PyTest will run all tests in the test folder and all Python files starting with test underscore. And then inside test, inside those files, it'll run all functions that start with test underscore. So I'm simply um, just adopting the, the accepted standard in that regard. So within that folder, we have um, a, a module to test all our front end, to, to run all our front end unit tests. We also want to use our test database test database and our test database data to run the test so that we can control the variables and make sure that the endpoint behaves in a way that we expect. And then there's a second one to test the root endpoint. And then finally, um, I guess for those of you, you know, that, that haven't started using Batfish, you, you might find this, um, this last file of value. Um, I built just a tiny little toolkit, which essentially, um, helps you, um, you know, take in a folder of configs and create Batfish snapshots. Um, and then you can ask it certain questions and it'll save those outputs to CSVs. So I think um, Rick roughly touched on that uh, in, in the Batfish 101 demo, but you might find some value in that, in that tool because I've developed a bunch of functions that will save you having to rewrite them. Okay, so... Back to the application folder, I'll just sort of describe these files in a little bit more detail. So as I mentioned before, the main.py, you can name these files, whatever you like, but you know, just stick with, stick with this, the standard. The main PY file, that's the main application. And that essentially calls in modules at runtime and, and, you know, ties everything together and cert and, you know, serves the service. So the main PY file. Um, in my example, is going to go on the API folder into API v1 and call this AP, API py module. And then what that module does is it, it pulls in route routers, which are like um, the endpoints, I guess. And so that will then call in this Batfish endpoint um, API related endpoint. And so like if we were to talk about like scaling out this solution, some of the examples we could do is we could have like another file for, you know, nor near operations or another file for, um, I don't know, um, napalm endpoints or, or another one for whatever we need. But also like having this folder structure, um, let's say we start out with batfish.py and, we'll, and then we decided, you know what, we need to, we need to give this endpoint a rethink and we need to restructure the, you know, the parameters that we supply to the customer. We could simply set up an, a new folder called API v2 and then version, you know, start developing our new endpoints into our new folder and then have a way of like gracefully, um, top, you know, at some point retiring version one and serving version two, or we could serve them both concurrently at the same time. Um, so Assuming that someone calls the, the, the endpoint, which, um, which is located in this folder, which was that, that, that function that I showed you before with the Python decorator. Um, we, what we have, what I've done here is I've decoupled the actual front end, um, processing of the request with the back end actual retrieving the data from the database. So what we've got here is, um, inside this particular 
file, it, it actually input, it calls this backend toolkit and the toolkit does all the, all the retrieving of the database files, which are the CSV files and the translation of the files. And it checks that the, that the file is present. And so essentially what happens is this endpoint calls this toolkit and this toolkit does all the work in terms of retrieving data from a database. So again, separating that, the separating of the concerns and then allowing yourself to scale um, your solution um, and keeping things sort of separate. It's obviously a little bit of work up front, but um, should you should you decide to do something like this, this is just one way of doing it. And then I guess the last folder that I haven't explained is I've set up this, this shared folder under the app folder and I've got this utilities.py. And basically what that is, is, you know, a set of global variables or settings that I set globally in this file. And then I import them as needed throughout these various modules and just saves, um, saves on repetition. Um, and you know, the other advantage of this is, for example, if I change the, the, the 404, um, response dictionary, I just change it in this one file. And not only does it change what it serves to the API, it'll actually, um, because it's being imported into my tests, it's going to like pass the test as well. So changing something in one spot and then letting that flow through to everywhere instead of having that manually defined in my test files. Okay. So now the bit that we've been waiting for, um, using the, the API endpoint. So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to my lab environment. So, um, what I'm doing here is I've got, um, this is just my lab, uh, my lab environment and it's serving this, um, this fast API demo. <clears throat> um, and I'll just show you a few things first. So, um, fast API actually has, it actually has, um, two API documentation formats. So you have this this redoc format. So, um, it's just, um, I guess a different way of presenting the same data. And as you can see in here, um, you know, it's, it's just, just an alternate way of doing it. I, I'm not really a fan of this one. Um, it doesn't have the try it out button, which I'll show you. Um, so I tend to stick to the, the, this, um, open, open API or swagger, um, documentation. So, Maybe some of you have seen, um, seen this sort of format before with other APIs, um, some, some popular network, um, automation products that use this sort of style are things like, um, NetPalm and Nautobot and Netbox. They both use, um, this Swagger API documentation. Those of you, um, that use some networking products, Viptala uses this a similar format. So, um, hopefully this is, this is familiar to you. Um, all this stuff is configurable, so I can configure this header. I can configure the version that I'm serving. Um, it has a concept called tags. And so imagine like back to the, the, the cafe example, imagine you had like six different coffees, eight different soft drinks, 13 different beers, 12 different wines. You wouldn't, you wouldn't group all that under one heading. You would use tags, you know, like coffee and then you'd, put all the coffees under there and then, you know, beverages, you'd put all the non-alcoholic beverages under there. So, um, tags are a really good way of grouping your endpoints. And obviously you can put your descriptions on your tags, which, which really help users, um, particularly when you've got like two or 300 endpoints. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're just going to, um, have a go at, go at the, the API endpoint. So, as shown before, um, we have all this, this documentation that, um, that, that I showed in the other slide. So we, we can read through all this and, um, understand like what it is that we actually need to set. Um, so the first thing you can do, which, which, which is great is do this try it out feature. So the minute you press that, um, these, these boxes now are now available for you to start entering data. So the first thing I'm going to do is, um, 
uh, before I call this API endpoint. Essentially what this does is there's a Batfish question called interface properties. Um, and for those of you that, that didn't attend the demo, um, you can get a vendor neutral model of um, the interface properties on a particular interface on a, on a network device. So, you know, Batfish is really valuable for this because I can, um, I'm going to query a, a CSR router in this particular example, but we, we will query a Juniper device, we can query a Nexus device, and we're going to get a vendor neutral data model, which, which, which you're going to see. So I'm going to query uh, this particular timestamp file for this particular node and all the true interfaces, and I'm going to click execute. So a few things you'll notice straight away. Um, you, you get this, um, so for those of you that use curl or, or, or need something quickly, um, it gives you the curl command. It also gives you the, um, you know, the request URL. Um, and then it gives you the actual response. So, you know, in this example, um, interface gigabit ethernet three, it's active, it's got this allowed prefix, it's got this name, it's got this description and so on and so forth. It's also got this interface. So, um, you know, just to, just to prove what I'm talking about, let's try a Juniper device. And as you can see, um, this, there's only, uh, there's two Juniper interfaces that are up and all that information. Um, now, um, I'll just show you something else. Like for example, if I put in an invalid node name, I hit execute, I get back my, um, you know, I get back a different response, which is 404 device not found. So this is a really cool way of like, before you even start bothering writing Python code, like you can actually test out your API calls and, you know, make sure it is what you, Ex what you are expecting before you start like trying to actually write automation. So um, this is, a, this is, I find this really useful. Um, what I'll do is I'll go back to this one and I can copy this request URL <coughs> and I can paste this in a web browser for those of you that um, use Firefox. And it's going to give me this, this prettified format out so I can see all all the information that I'm after and I can, you know, minimize this as an example. Um, but now, um, so before I, I mentioned, you know, that this is a Boolean, this active parameter is a, a type of Boolean. So I guess let's, let's, let's try and see what happens if we set the, the active parameter to something like Rick. And so when we do this, we, we, we actually get back, um, you know, this is just obviously using Firefox. So you're not going to see, it's not like a Python application, but it's basically telling us that we tried to query using the active argument and what we supplied isn't a valid Boolean. So this is an example of that, <clears throat> that data validation um, being bubbled up to the user pretty early on. Hey, okay. yep. Someone have a question? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering. So um, the testing that you can uh, perform in the documentation here, if you would have enabled authentication, I guess a pop-up would uh, would appear and, and ask you for credentials. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, <clears throat> depending on the authentication method, um, some of them have like a authorize or some of them um, might have, um, for example, if it's an API key, then you'll actually um, have to specify an API key. Um, you know, like in, if you look at this like Swagger documentation, there'd be say an API key, and then um, there might be some other documentation which tells you how to get the API key. And you'd have to supply that to get the valid response. Thanks. Um, okay, so uh, next I will, apologies. Uh, 
just talk about um, using GitHub Actions. Um, does anyone here use any continuous integration tools like Jenkins or Travis CI or GitHub Actions? Does anyone understand what that is? I've only used uh, Travis in the past. Okay, right. Um, so um, it's very similar to Travis. Um, so basically what we can do is we can, um, we can build a bunch of tests that we like to use for our project. And then we can um, bundle those, those tests up and run them on a runner and run them in a pipeline. So the example that I wanted to show you is um, um, Rick touched on this on in his um, clean code example about using um, make files and, and doing linting and, and code quality checks. Um, in my particular demo, what I'm doing is I'm doing a series of like linting checks. So I'm doing black formatting, um, PyLama, which is which is similar to Flake 8, um, which I think Rick uses. Um, YAML lint, so checking the validity of YAML files, Bandit checking for any security issues with my code. And then down the bottom here, the, the bit that I wanted to show you is PyTest. So it's actually um, running all my um, unit tests. So why is this valuable? Um, if, you, if you have a team working on an API, um, when you get a pull request from, from your colleague, you can ensure that, um, that they've actually passed all the unit tests before you bother um, reviewing and approving their code. So um, this will, this will again, as I mentioned before, it instantiates like a local instance on this, on this um, in this example, it's a, an Ubuntu host, like spins this Ubuntu host up, downloads your code, runs the test on the local server and passes it. So when you, um, when you go to approve your request, um, like if I go back to one of these old requests, you're gonna get something like, um, You've got all these, all these checks. Oh, that's a bad example. Uh, you'll get all your uh, GitHub action checks and they'll all pass or they'll all fail. Um, and I guess, I guess just talking more, more broadly, um, it allows you to like build things with confidence and um, review things with confidence and make sure that people are passing, you know, the minimum standards that you've defined for the project. So I know I've, I've covered a lot um, and I'm happy to go into the, into the details of the code. I've got, I've got that here as well. Um, and I just wanted to say thanks. Thanks all for listening. And yeah, yeah, I'll open it up to any questions that you might have now. That was, uh, that was really good, Daniel. Thanks. So the only, the only question I had from my side anyway was how the, um, <clears throat> Within that API call you did, you, you referenced like a date timestamp, which yep. I think references those CSV files, right? Yep. Um, how does that work? So if you, I mean, if you've already, when does it generate that, that database? Like, so if you put in a date that it, you hadn't run the API on, how would, how mm -hmm. would that work? Yeah. Okay. So um, if I put in, um, I don't know. Let's just go say 20, 2022. Uh, three. Press the wrong button on my Bluetooth keyboard. Apologies. Um, so if I put in say next year's date, um, what I'm getting back is a is an item not found, but Rick under the hood what's happening is um, it's, it's the, the back end, I'll, I'll show you in the code, but the back end calls that, that, that back end toolkit and that tries to locate the file. And when it can't locate the file, it then tells the endpoint to tell the user that it's not found. So um, I can show you that. So you have to, do you have to manually create those files then? Oh, certainly not. No, you could, you could make live calls to, to Batfish, but for the purposes of this demo, um, what I wanted to show was, um, like an offline contained example. 
because mm, okay. I um the, the idea of this is this is packaged so that um yourself or um, anyone on this call could clone this repo and just run it on your local machine with no external dependencies and then that then you can play around with it should you wish cool cool yeah so um so if we go into the app um we go into the so if I just, um, I'm just going to split screen so you, so you all can sort of see. Um, basically, this calls a, a function called get all interfaces active, Rick. And basically, if it finds some data, it'll return it. Else, it'll raise um, a 404, not found. And so when I click on get all interfaces active, it basically calls this backend toolkit. And the backend toolkit um, then tries to find a file in the batfish database based on it just does like an f string to string together a file format and then tries to find the file and if it can't find the file it um it just returns you know none back to the back to the um to the application sorry back to the um api input okay cool Um, yeah, I've, I've, I've gone to quite a bit of trouble for those of you that that have experience with Python to um, like fully document all these files. So um, hopefully you can clone it and, and you know read through it and follow along and um, play around with it. And uh, yeah, like if you have any questions, I'm obviously um, in in the Slack community group, um, and I can I can help you out with that. Should you name? Cool. D does anyone else have any other questions about any of this? Or no? No, not from my side. But I would just want to thank, say thank you for the presentation. I haven't started any um, project with a REST um, API yet. So, so it's good to know about a fast API and start with a recent framework right away. Yeah, no worries. Um, like, uh, you know, depending on where you are in your automation journey, you'll, you'll obviously start out writing scripts and and, and, and smaller applications. Uh, but for any of you that have to provide like a platform for other people to automate on top of, this is sort of where this is going. Um, for example, um, you know, if you have an internal dashboard where you want to present, I don't know, statistical data about your devices. Um, in this example, I'm, I'm using Batfish information. So what you could do is you could potentially um, use this to like um, retrieve configured NTP servers on a device. And then what you could do is write, so you could serve that as an API service, like show me a device's NTP servers. And then you could write like a, a Python application on top of it that like checks it for, NT, for, for PCI compliance or HIPAA compliance, that the servers in the list are the correct NTP servers. So um, hopefully that sort of jogs some ideas of, of how you might use it, but yeah. That's really good. And um, I was going to ask if, have you used the, the Django REST framework before? Uh, no, I haven't. No, no. Yeah. Uh, it's because, yeah, cause you, I've, I've, that's what I've used before for building APIs. And it's quite, it does the auto, auto documentation and stuff, but it doesn't seem as lean as fast API in terms of the config. Like, what you were saying about splitting up the configs, like with Django, you, you've got like eight touch points that you have to update um, yep. to set up the API. So I think this definitely looks like it would kind of benefit folks with regards to that when developing our APIs and stuff. So, um, yeah. Apologies. Sorry, I've got one more thing to show you, which I forgot to show you. Um, I'll just show you all it quickly um so um i'll just bring up another i'll bring up a um 
another API. Um, so another Swagger API. It's just so I can sort of this is um, this is Nordobot, which is um, which is a network source of truth product. And um, for example, if I just go to their API documentation, um, takes a little while to load, but they have they have hundreds and hundreds of endpoints. So um, this concept of tags, um, like when you look at like a an API documentation with which with a product such as this, should it choose to load, um, you know you can see that there's hundreds of endpoints. They have different types of operations and whatnot and that that scrolls down forever um so obviously over here back to back to the batfish um api and and also with this one as well there's always this um api spec um so this is um if i click on this this is just a json representation of that file but what's really cool about this is i can actually copy this file and for those of you that um, does it do, do people know what Postman is or have experience with Postman? It's like a um, it's like a um, uh, a client that helps you you know with development. Um, I know some people that like configure whole ACI deployments using Postman, but what you can do is you can click import here and you can go over to raw text and copy that JSON data into here and click continue and click import. And so what I've done now is I've actually imported all that documentation into this application. And if you have a look through here, I've got, you know, a sample response um, and all my documentation. Um, Postman uses this concept of variables. Um, and what I've done here um, prior to this demo is I've set up an, an environment. If you think of an environment like, yeah, like a, I guess like a environment where you can set environment based settings, I've set the URL to, to my instance of this, this fast API tool. And so now what I can do is I can drive, um, instead of using the, the API tool, I can now drive um, using this tool, Postman. So I can uh, run run the endpoint. Where's the button gone? Oh, apologies. Um, I can um, I can do the same API call through this through this Postman application, right? And I and I get back all my data, and that's all cool. But then I can click on this code button. And I can I can find the the code snippet in in any programming language that that's shown here. So you know, for those of you who might be I don't know masters of PowerShell, you can get the PowerShell code snippet to run the same API call. Or if you're trying to learn GoLang, you can you can use this. Or should you be a you know JavaScript whisperer, you can use this as well. So this is um. This is only something that I found out recently. Um, so, you know, you can you can build your API spec, give it to someone else, and then, you know, if they like JavaScript, they can then just use this to work out what the Java-based equivalent of running the same API call is. That's a really good tip. That's, uh, I didn't realize you could do that. That's, that's really good. And um, so for those of you that... Um, that use Postman or um, like some people are like, oh, you know, you shouldn't use Postman if you're a real developer, et cetera, et cetera. Like I said before, I'll use any tool um, and learn any way that I can. Um, so I'm not above using these tools. I mean, ultimately we're here to produce the output. So you can um, rename this, this, this collection and you can import other collections. So I could um, go back over to, to Nordobot and um, download their um, specification. And I could also import that into um, my Postman client. So I could have my internal API collection. I could have ACI, Vipteller, Nordobot, Netbox, 
and you know then you've got all your collections and then you know when you need to de develop an automation solution you know you can use postman to to get you over that initial hump um, and get productive and work out what's the api call So that's really cool. That's really, really good. So slightly frustrating because I have built out, <laughs> I have built out API calls in uh, Postman before. <laughs> I've had the swagger. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I wish I'd known about this sooner. That's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, I don't know where everyone is on their automation journey, but like there are, there are lots of Postman collections out there for lots of solutions or lots of network products that you have out there. And, um, you know, not all APIs are created equally and not all API documentation is created equally. That's for sure. So using whatever you can to get, to get what you need, um, I'd, I'd highly recommend it. Um, you can also, um, drop in the chat, Rick, a couple of links to, um, some people who've got like aggregated collections of, of postman collections. To help to help everyone out yeah that would be really really useful um yeah if you've got any links yes put them in the slack as well because then um other folks might might see it and that'd be really really handy um so so yeah, yeah. good stuff cool well yeah no thanks for your time today and thanks for diving in to, to everything in such detail it's really really good so um has anyone else got any other questions anything they wanted to raise ask daniel you can literally ask me anything you like so i have to say i did like your coffee analogy okay being, being a big fan of coffee and, oh, uh, and, yeah. and APIs, <laughs> it, it rang true. So there's a, uh, for, for those of you who like to, to muck around, I think there's a, a Chuck Norris API, um, practice your API skills. So you can ask, okay. ask, a, ask for a Chuck Norris joke. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's plenty of like, there's plenty of APIs out there to just practice on. Um, it's a really good skill to have being able to understand um, content types and encoding and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, no, it's really cool. Do, does, um, do you know if Fast API has any extensions for GraphQL? Oh, that's a good question. I'll have to check out the... the API docs, Fast API docs. It's... I think it's only been around for I think maybe three years, but it is gaining gaining a lot of traction. Um, it does it does appear so, Rick. I'll put the link in the in the chat. Yeah, cool. I might have a look into that as well. That's really good. Good stuff. Well, yeah. If if no one's got anything else, then we can probably um, we can probably close things off here, right? And, and uh, yeah, no. Thanks again, Daniel. It's been cool been really really good i really appreciate Not a problem that. we loved it man yeah. thank you sorry that's okay um yeah if you have any questions obviously um you can just uh match me in in the slack channel obviously i'll probably get back to you in a, a weird time um probably not european hours friendly but um i'll do my best and um yeah good luck and just let us know if you need any help cheers good stuff great work Thanks, all. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.